Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you that there is a way that has been made so that death can be abolished and eternal life can be brought within the reach of every member of the human family. We thank you that you have made a way for each one of us and that you have a personal interest in us. And we pray that as we study this afternoon that you will help us to understand the real situation that we are in and what we are to do. How we are to be ready for the future. And we thank you because we're claiming that your Holy Spirit will be our teacher as we study your word. We pray this in Jesus' name for his sake. Claiming his promise that his spirit will be given and will guide us into all truth. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 start again. Then we are actually going to get into the subject that I intended to get into this morning and then talk so long on the preliminary stu subject to introduce it and we didn't get there. <clears throat> when I first started preaching sermons on this passage of Scripture, as I told you, I, I found 18 specifications for the sheep. I found between 20 and 30 specifications in this passage concerning the shepherd. And now we are going to look at the wolves. And in our last meeting, we're going to look both at the wolves and at the fold. Let's turn back to John the 10th chapter first of all and we'll read about the wolves. That's part of the, that's part of the story that's, that Jesus told. A big part of the story has to do with the wolves. So if you have your Bible open to John the 10th chapter. <coughs> it says, starting in verse 12, but he who is a hireling and not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. Jesus had quite a bit to say actually about the wolves, not only in this place, but in other scriptures. And uh, let's look at a few facts about the wolves. Uh, turn in your Bible to uh, Matthew 7, starting with verse 15. It says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. By the way, who is somebody that's in sheep's clothing? Are they a Christian or an atheist? Who are they? If they're in sheep's clothing, they claim to be a Christian. Now, they're not really a Christian, but they claim to be a Christian. See, this is one of the problems that we've had to deal with in the great controversy for 6,000 years. This is a problem that we, we all deal with it all through our lives. <clears throat> the way a human being's brain was programmed at the beginning, the way that we learn, 
the way a baby learns and all human beings learns. When you hear something, you know, when the baby hears something, baby is, that's the way it is. See something, they assume that's the way it is. They just know that. That's why it is so dangerous to show your little children fictitious movies. For them to be watching things on television or video that aren't true. For them it is true. And there are many young people who rejected the Christian religion, rejected their parents, won't have anything to do with it anymore. When they find out they're told lies. There are many people, there have many young people have become very angry with their guardians when they found out there wasn't any such thing as Santa Claus. Wasn't any such thing as a lot of other things they were told. Where did we ever get this custom of telling, quote, fairy tales to children? That's of the devil. That's so that they will be deceived right from the get-go. The human brain was made so that when you see something, you assume that that's the way it is. If you hear something, let's see, the devil's a deceiver. So he, he comes to you in ways that it's not the way it looks. So the wolves do not come to you as wolves. They're in what kind of clothing? They're in sheep's clothing. When the devil came to Eve, if he had come to her as an angel of light, she would have immediately known who she was dealing with and she would have run away. He didn't come to her that way. He came to her in the form of one of the most beautiful creatures the serpent. And after, the, after God cursed the serpent, that's a very interesting subject to study, by the way. The most beautiful creature that God created became the ugliest and the most feared and the most hated of all creatures. Uh, of all, the, all animals, probably snakes are hated worse or most than any other one. And that's not just by human beings. Even animals hate snakes. Dogs and cats hate snakes. Cattle hate snakes. Horses hate snakes. But the devil came to Eve in a way that she didn't know who he was. That's how the human race was deceived. The whole great conference has started with a deception. You can study even the way the devil deceived the angels in heaven. It's very interesting. That's not our subject. But if you look at how he deceived the angels in heaven, first chapter of the great controversy, they did not realize what was really happening. One of the first facts to, to understand about the wolves is that they don't look like wolves. They look like sheep. So since they look like sheep, you've got to have some kind of, kind of way to figure out who they really are. So most of what Jesus says here, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know, know them. Notice, you cannot tell by their appearance which are sheep and which are wolves. If you just look, it looks like you look inside the fold and all you can see is sheep. But they're not all sheep. Some that look like sheep are not sheep. They're wolves. I call it sometimes the imitation game. There are imitations, Christians. They have been baptized with water. Their name is on the church book. They are members of good and regular standing. Not only that, when the wolves come in, they, they want to get leadership positions. So they are elders and deacons and ministers and evangelists and administrators 
in high places and Jesus said you can't tell them by the way they look because they look like sheep they look just like sheep so you have to look at what not what they profess because they profess to be sheep they look like sheep and they profess to be sheep but they're not really sheep well then how can you tell well Jesus said you have to look at what they do It's not what somebody professes. It's what do they actually do. Now, in the Bible, this is in Matthew 7, and in the first verse of Matthew 7, it says, Judge not that you be not judged. And that's a terribly misabused verse. Especially the wolves love to abuse that verse over and over. And then say, oh, the Word said don't judge. Well, we'll read the whole chapter. Don't just read the first verse. When Jesus said in the first verse, judge not that you be not judged, we are not to judge a person's heart or their character. We're not to judge their motives. But are we supposed to pass judgment on people on the basis of what they do? Well, absolutely. What the fruit is what people do. What a person does shows whether that person is a really a sheep or whether they are a wolf. Now, so the first thing about the wolves, the first fact to understand is the wolves pretend to be sheep. They claim to be sheep. They profess that they are sheep. Second fact about the wolves is that the wolves have not gone through the door. In fact, if you have not gone through the door, you're not one of the sheep. You might be a wolf, you might be a goat, but you're not one of the sheep if you haven't gone through the door. We discussed what it means to go through the door this morning. The wolves have not gone through the door. They have gone, gotten into the fold another way. They had to climb over the fence to get in the fold. So they're inside. They've been baptized with water. They claim to be Christians. They claim to be following Jesus, but they're not his sheep. And as we just said this morning, many of these people actually believe. By the way, the Bible, let's read it. Look to 2 Timothy. The third chapter. Now this is an amazing verse, that the more you study it, the more it will open up to your mind. 2 Timothy 3, verse 13. It says, But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, one of the interesting things about this verse, 2 Timothy 3.13, is that these people that are deceiving others, not only are they deceiving others, but what also is happening? What does it say? They're being deceived too. When you deceive somebody else, you think you're deceiving somebody else, but you're going to be deceived yourself. Now, by the way, this is like a lot of other verses in Scripture. It's so deep that I don't claim that I understand it all, even though it is opening up to my mind. But whenever you deceive, according to this verse, when you deceive somebody else, you're also going to get deceived yourself. Is that what the verse teaches? If I deceive somebody else, am I going to get deceived too? Let me tell you, I don't know all the ways that this happens. I certainly don't claim to, but I'll tell you one way that happens. If you tell somebody else a lie 
Now, the more times you tell them a lie, the more the, the greater is the chance that they'll believe it. Hitler understood that. That's how propaganda is built. You tell somebody something over and over again, and eventually they're going to believe it, even if they didn't believe it when you started telling them. That, by the way, is one of the ways people become so convinced that evolution is a fact. They've been told in school over and over again ever since the first grade, over and over and over and over again. They've been told it so often, so many times, that eventually in their mind it's a fact. Now, if you go to the, the leaders of the, uh, that teach evolution and, and talk it over them, some of them will acknowledge that well, actually it's a theory. It's not a fact. There, there, there's no, we, we don't have any written documented records of what happened in this world 10,000 years ago or any time. There are no records. We don't, have, we don't have any evidence from that time. There is no evidence from 10,000 years ago that's written that we have. We, just don't have, we don't have the evidence. But people have postulated this, made this theory. And people have been told the theory over and over again. And if you tell somebody else a lie enough times, they will probably believe it, but something else happens. After you've told the lie often enough, not only do they believe the lie, but eventually you believe the lie. You, 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 made it, you made me knew you were deceiving them when you started, but you've told the lie so many times that now you believe it too. Now what I'm going to tell you now, and I, I don't think that preachers have spent a lot of time doing this, but I'm going to take, indulge myself enough to just let you know, just briefly, that I have an opinion on this subject, and you can set it up and make your own opinion, and it can be different than mine. But it is my opinion, and I have derived this opinion from my own study, the spirit of prophecy, it is my opinion that the devil himself is deceived. That he has spent so many thousand years trying to deceive others that I believe that on certain things he's trying to deceive others, but he's deceived himself. That's my opinion. And uh, I'll find out in the morning whether my opinion is right or not, but it's a fact we know for sure in regard to mankind that when you deceive somebody else, you're going to end up being deceived yourself. The Bible says that. So, we, we, if you understand that, then, you know, some people say, oh, the main thing is that you're sincere. You know, have you ever heard somebody say, oh, that you, are you sincere? Let me tell you something. Ellen White says that the Pharisees were sincere. Many of them. They still lost their soul. Many of the wolves are sincere. There were many people that, many people, we don't know, that actually believed. They believed with all their heart and soul that Noah was a deluded fanatic and that he did not know what he was talking about. They were sincere in that belief. They still drowned. My dear friend, you can be totally sincere and be lost. There is no assurance anywhere in inspired writings that sincere, all sincere people will be saved. There's no assurance like that whatsoever. It is not enough to be sincere. You need to believe the truth. Okay, those are a couple facts or so on the walls. Here's another one. Wolves bite. Sheep don't bite. Wolves bite. How do we bite each other? How, how, it, you know, if, if you're in the sheepfold, if you're in the sheepfold and you're getting bit, you, 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 you're around some wolves. How do we bite each other? It was very interesting when some years ago I was studying Hebrew, trying to understand the Bible and read it in Hebrew. It was very interesting where I'll let me show it to you. You have your Bible. 
Turn back to Psalm 15. Now Psalm 15 it asks the question, who's going to be in it asks the question, who's going to be in heaven? Well then it gives the specifications who's going to be saved. Very interesting psalm. You could memorize Psalm 15 in a short time, it's worth memorizing. Very interesting chapter, just a short verse, a short chapter. And one of the specifications is in Psalm 15, verse 5, it says, He who does not put out his money at usury. Now, what is usury? Most governments, I know the United States government, the state governments, we have laws in regard to usury. Usury is charging excess interest on your money when you loan it out. That's what usury is. Now, it is not evil to charge interest on your money if you loan it out. How do you know that? Well, look here in Matthew 25. Matthew 25. This is the unjust steward that had one talent and didn't do anything with it. And we read in verses 26 and 27. It says, But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown, and gather where I have not secured scattered seed. Therefore you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with what? Interest. With interest. Well, where does the interest come from? I remember when I was a child, and back in those days, I could take my money and I could put it in a savings and loan association and I would get guaranteed four and a quarter percent uh, per annum on the money. I just leave it and then I could withdraw it from whenever I wanted. It was on demand, an account. I didn't understand. I thought, you know, where does this money come from? They're putting more money in my account. Where are they putting, getting that money from? Well, where they're getting from, they were taking that, those accounts with all that money, the savings and loan, and they were loaning it to people that were building houses or buying houses, and they were loaning them money on the house, and then on the mortgage, that uh, on the house mortgage, they were paying six, eight, nine percent interest. They were paying me four percent, and so that they were getting, of course, the way they made money, they made money on the spread. So uh, that has become shall I say, almost a racket in the world today. Uh, if you know what's going on in the finance world, what we do now, we do, the big bankers do this with billions of dollars. We go to countries where the interest rate is low. For example, in Japan, I don't know what it is right now, but the interest rate, the, the Japanese government, they're the same fix the, Amer the United States government is in, and so to deal with their problem, in order to try to stimulate their economy, they shut the interest rate down to almost zero. So, you know what the result of that has been? Bankers in the United States and Western Europe have gone to Japan and borrowed billions, billions, many billions, hundreds of billions of dollars, and they take this money and they then they deposit it in, into Australian dollars and Swiss francs. In Australian dollars, right now, you can get about Oh, almost four percent. So, if you just figured out yourself, if you borrowed a billion dollars at a half a percent, one half of one percent, and you then you deposited it somewhere where you were going to get three and a half percent, so you, the spread would be three percent. How much would three percent be in a billion dollars? You see that the, you could make a little money, uh, and uh, the big financial institutions have been doing that. That's called, by the way, the carry trade, and. Uh, the spread is the way they make money. That's the way that, that all banks make money. Banks make money on the spread. They, they take your money, they pay you almost nothing for it today, and then they loan it out. But let me tell you, when they loan it out, they don't loan it out for almost nothing. They, they want six or seven or eight percent when they loan it out. And so they make, the banker makes money on the spread. Now, there's nothing wrong, there's nothing inherently wrong with the, having a bank or bank, but 
A banking is just like any other business. You can operate it in a righteous way or a non-righteous way. And I better not get into a discussion about that because uh, that's one of the problems. If, if any of you that are in ministry like we are, this is one of the huge problems in the world today. We cannot, we cannot carry on the ministry that the Lord has submitted to our hands, which is international in scope, without dealing with the banks. Uh, we um, steps to life employs probably four times as many people overseas as in the United States. We employ most of most of our employees are in Africa and in India. We have dozens of Bible workers over there. Uh, the Lord is blessed with what has happened. Uh, uh, in, in Kenya, for example, where just about 10 years ago, there were, there was one or two churches, now we have 60 churches. And if it keeps going in just a short time, then instead of 60, it'll be in the hundreds of churches. The churches are multiplying rapidly over there. And the uh, same, same thing started to happen in Zambia and uh, Nigeria and some other countries. So please pray you and I are never going to get out of this world until the three angels' messages goes to all the world. Do you believe that? We are not going to get out of this world until the three angels' messages go to all the world. Now, some people have said to us, well, you can never take it to all the world. We said, well, we're not, we're not claiming anything. It's just whatever the Lord gives us the opportunity to do, we're going to try to do something. And uh, I want to, want to talk about doing something later today if we get a chance. But... Uh, there, there's, in order to carry on our work, we have to deal with the banking system. One of our big problems, my parents, when I was a very small child, my parents were missionaries for the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the land of Burma. It's, it's a mind mark day. Are you aware of the fact that uh, we have wanted to help some mission projects over there get going? We haven't been able to do it. You know why? We don't have any way to transfer money over there, get money over there. Uh, we inquired just a few years ago, how can we get some money into that country to help certain projects? And we were told, they said, well, if you want to send money into this country, you have to send a person over here with the money. There's no way we can transfer it. Uh, in Africa, it used to be we have, we, we have transferred thousands and thousands of dollars to Africa and South America through Western Union. Well, they had some dishonest people in Western Union in an office, I think, in Africa, stole our money. Well, we, uh, the people stole our money, and so the people that were supposed to get it didn't get it. So we complained, and we started going through official channels to say we sent this much, we had all the paperwork, and, and they're supposed to get this, this person never got it. They kept giving excuse after excuse after excuse. I don't know what they did. By the grace of God, we finally got the money to them, to the people, after some months of uh, delay. And we've had the same problem in uh, banks in uh, Africa. You send a check or, or a wire to a bank, and they'll hold it for six weeks. That way they get to use your money free for six weeks before they let the person have it. All kinds of craziness goes on in these uh, third world countries with money. It's a, just a, uh, one of the biggest problems of trying to work over there is having to deal with the money system. When you want to transfer money, you can't afford to pay somebody $2,000 to get on an airline and fly over there to deliver money. You have to be able to transfer it to the system. So we then started trying to use MoneyGram. Well, I won't go into more that. We had even more trouble with money grant than Western Union. So now we're using Western Union again. In some places where we some places we can use PayPal and and wire money through banks or whatever. But uh, the banking, the, that's the way the banking industry works. They take your money, they loan it to somebody else for more than they pay you, and then they get the spread. That's the way they make their income. And insurance is some, similar to banking, only the insurance, the insurance industry is even bigger than the banking industry. The insurance industry is, are you aware of the fact that the insurance industry is the biggest business in the world? And uh, what the insurance industry does, the richest people in the world are in, in the insurance industry. Uh, Warren Buffett, who's the most wealthy or second wealthiest man in the world, he's made most of his money through the insurance industry. And uh, <clears throat> what the insurance industry does is they take your money and they look over your town and they, so let's say that you decide to buy fire insurance on your house. They look over the town, they say, well, on the average, uh, say one, just say for instance, one house in every 10,000 burns down in this town. So we know they take an actuary and study all this out. What's the chances of this happening or that happening? And they look at what they think is the worst case scenario. And uh, then 
they, they take your money and then if it doesn't happen, of course, they just keep the premium. And it is one of the most interesting things about my way of thinking is that people don't ever get angry when the insurance company doesn't have to pay. You know, here they've just given them hundreds of dollars that year. They, the insurance company didn't give them anything, uh, but they're happy because, uh, you know, they, they're insured. Uh, and uh, so between the time you pay them the money and they have to pay you, if they have to pay you, that, that interval period, they get to use your money free. And nobody thinks anything about that. That is called the float. And with big insurance companies, the float, the money that's been paid in that they don't have to pay out, that float amounts to billions and billions of dollars. And so they take that and they insure that money. And some people wonder, well, why do these companies have so much money? Well, if you start understanding how the float works and you get somebody that's really a really smart investor to invest that float, you can understand how the insurance company is the biggest business in the world. And so these businesses that they take money and they make money off of other people's money, that's the way the banking industry works. And it's not wrong if they do it in a righteous manner. But how, the next question is, how much interest should you charge? And that's where things get sticky. In, Meda, in ancient Medo-Persia, they had some problem with inflation in the latter time of Medo, ancient Medo-Persian Empire, and the interest rates went up to 45%. That's high interest. I, I've always thought that 45% interest was usurious. Uh, I had to pay 29% interest one time. I thought that was probably usury myself, but uh, anyway, uh, usury is charging excess interest. Now, wolves bite. The Hebrew word to charge interest or usury literally means to bite. And let me just take just three or four minutes for the sake of, there's a few young people there, just for the sake of the young people, let me just run something by you. I find there's a lot of young people for one reason or another, their parents never told them this. In general, there are usually two kinds of people in the world. There are people that receive interest on their money, and there are people that pay interest on their debts. Now, if you're a young person, tell me this. Which one of those groups of people would you prefer to be in? <laughs> Uh, think it through. One of the biggest mistakes that many of us make when we're young is borrowing money. That's one of the biggest mistakes that young people make in their finances. And do not think, my young friend, that you have to have everything that your mother and father have when you're 25 years old. You don't. You don't have to have everything. You can acquire slowly over your lifetime. You don't have to have everything right away. And uh, we have a lot of young people who, we have, we have a lot of people in their 30s that are trapped, that are literally trapped because of their debts. They have been bitten big time and they cannot get free. They are in a trap. We have people that we have wanted to help. I'll just let, let me mention a few of the traps. One of the huge traps today is student loans. Student loans. Now, just I haven't read the statistics last lately. Several years, in fact, ten years. I'll tell you, ten years ago, I haven't read it recently. Ten years ago. The average debt of a student all over the United States graduating from medical school. And this is from public universities too, not private. Private is more expensive than public. But this is public universities. The average debt of the average medical student graduating from medical school over uh, 10 years ago was just between 100 and 110,000. That's average. Now, Ben Bernanke, who has been, I guess he's going to be changed now, but he's been the chairman of the Federal Reserve, he made a speech recently and he's talked about this, 
And he was mentioning how his son, his son, by the time he gets out of medical school, his son is, he expects him to be $400,000 in debt. Did you hear that? Did you see that? So we've got people coming out of Loma Melinda, and, uh, and, the medical, and they're, they're 200,000, 300,000, and more in debt. And so, they can be earning real good money. They have to earn real good money. Because the ones that I've dealt with are paying like 5 or 6 percent. Uh, I, haven't, I don't have a calculator. I could probably calculate without a calculator. What? Let's see, 6 percent on uh, 400000 would be $2,000 a month. Your interest on a 6 percent on a $400,000 loan your, your it, just the interest, not, not getting anything paid on the principal, just the interest would be $2,000 a month. Now let me ask you something. You think you could talk to one of those people about going to Africa as a missionary? <laughs> they can't go to Africa as a missionary. They can't go anywhere. They, they can't even help you with your evangelistic campaign in your local town. They've got to keep their nose to the grindstone. It's a trap. There are many, many traps. Wolves are in the church to trap the sheep, bite the sheep. Well, I better quit talking on that. You'll think that I'm becoming overbearing. I'm not trying to be overbearing, but I have to deal with these things, by the way, friends, all the time. We, we try to help people that won't want to become... Uh, we, we had a, a man that became a Bible worker at Steps to Life. He was only a Bible worker for a few months. And he quit. Took a, a secular job. Very good friends of ours. Uh, we love this man. He's, a, he's, a, he's giving his heart to the Lord. He's a very dedicated, sincere Christian. But why didn't he keep doing Bible work? because he can't afford our wages. And, and we pay more wages than most self-supporting institutions. But we don't pay market rates. And he's interested in being a Bible worker, but he can. He has debts. He has to make more money than we can pay. And there are people all over the country. They'd like to do mission work, but they can't because they're trapped. The devil has them trapped. The wolves have them trapped. They are they're in a trap of debt. They can't go as missionaries. They can't do Bible work. They can't do a lot of things for the Lord they'd like to do because they're trapped. The wolf bites. <coughs> and then notice what Jesus said that the wolf does. Notice in John 10th chapter, it says, the wolf catches the sheep. That's the first thing he does. He catches the sheep. And the second thing he does, that he mentions, there's in verse 12, he scatters the sheep. The wolf catches the sheep, and he scatters the sheep. Now, friends, this is a parable. He's not talking about physically catching. He's using the physical terms to describe something that's happening in the spiritual world. How does a sheep get caught? Remember in Matthew 7, the wolf is called a false prophet or a false teacher. So how does the wolf catch the sheep? When you accept his false teaching and you believe it, you have been caught. And the sheep are caught and they don't even know they've been in a trap, but they're caught. They're now promoting what the wolf has taught them. And my dear friends, this is going on all over Adventism, all over the world. There are sheep 
They're sheep. These are not the wolves in sheep's clothing. These are the sheep. But they've been caught by the wolf in the, in the fold. There's the wolf in the fold, and the wolf has caught the sheep in the fold, and now the sheep is talking to you, and he's really a sheep. He's really, he's really one of the Lord's children. He's gone through the door, but he's been caught. He's deceived on his doctrines. Are there any? Are there anybody? Is there anybody anywhere in the world? Are there any Seventh Day Adventists that have been caught that are that they're sincere and they're 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 really Christians, but they've been caught. They're teaching false doctrines and they don't even know it. They they think it's the truth. Oh my! Do they ever think it's the truth? They send to me packets. I receive things. These are eight and a half by eleven and be that high. The documents so that I can get converted. And I look at these things and say, Lord, I'm interested in knowing the new truth. I'm just not interested in being deceived. I need to thus set the Lord to back this up. By the way, I don't have my great controversy with me, but look in your own great controversy, page 595. She says that before accepting any doctrine or teaching, even if it's being taught by the majority, or by the clergy, by the wise people, she said before accepting any doctrine or teaching, we should demand. Now demand is a strong word, isn't it? We should demand. What should we demand? Yes. Uh, thus set the Lord in a support. That's what I try to do. Because I get all these... I'm supposed to be, I'm getting all these information about all the new teachings and new truths and everything all the time. I say, okay, where is the thus set the Lord? That's what I'm supposed to demand. That's not being on Christ like. It's not being on Christ like to demand a plain thus of the Lord. When the people came to Jesus as a child or a young person in the Book of Desire of Ages, they tried to force all their doctrines and teachings of the rabbis on him, and he said, Show me in the scripture where it says that. And that made him angry because they couldn't show him. They could show him from the Talmud. They could show him from the Mishnah. They could show him from all their theology books. But they couldn't show him from the Bible. My dear friend, it is not on Christ-like to demand a thus says the Lord for anything you've got to believe. And if the Lord doesn't say so, how come you believe it? You're getting caught by one of the wolves in the fold. Remember, there are wolves in the fold. They're in there. They look like sheep. We can quote scripture, though. Well, of course they'll quote scripture. The devil can quote scripture. He's a master at it. And Ellen White says, in the time in which we're living, she says, Satan, clothed in angel robes, will attempt to deceive the very elect. Look at volume 5, page 80 for that. Page 881. She says, every wind of doctrine will be blowing. Have you noticed the winds of doctrine increasing in Adventism? And these doctrines are splitting up ministries, splitting up churches, splitting up fellowships all over the country. And some people say, Lord, why are you allowing this to happen? Let me ask you this question. Why did Jesus allow it to happen? Do you know how bad it got when Jesus was here? Well, Look how bad I got. Look at John 3, 16. <clears throat> John 16, verse 32. <clears throat> this was the Thursday night. This was the very night that Jesus was betrayed. It says, Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone. It got so bad that all there was left was 11 men and a few faithful women and all of them left when Jesus was betrayed. He was left all alone. I've, I've marveled. That is one of the greatest astonishments of my life when I began to realize 
that when Jesus went to the cross to pay the price for your sin, He went all alone. There wasn't anybody. And I've told people, that, and I've told them this as I believe, if you are saved and if you live until Jesus comes, you are going to pass through experiences where it will look like you're the only one left in the world. Amen. People can be isolated. You all heard the story about what happened in the German army during World War I, and there were some Seventh-day Adventists that would not bear arms and they would not work on the Sabbath. And they said, you can't make a decision like this. This is wartime. You have to do what you're told. You can't do that. He said, I'm sorry. I, I, my conscience will not let me to do what you commanded me to do. They put him in prison. Threatened to execute him. I'm not a very good historian. I, you will have to tell me whether any of them actually got executed. I've been, I've been told both ways. By the way, incidentally, this is the reason that there is a Reformed Seventh-day Adventist Church because the general conference would not straighten this out. This was in the 1920s when they would not straighten it out. And they came to those German soldiers. They put them in, they put them in isolation by themselves. And they lied to them. They said, we've gone to all your buddies and they're all going to honor the orders of the German government. You're the only one. Why don't you just join with the rest and do what you're asked to do and be loyal to your country and don't be a traitor to your country. They appealed them along those lines, every one of them. They said, told them they, were the, they lied to them. They told them they were the only one left. And that group, even when they were told that they were the only one left, they wouldn't do it. So my friend, if you live until Jesus comes, you're going to get at some point you're going to get into a situation like that where it's going to look like you are the only one. The wolf catches the sheep. And so there are sheep today, they're really sheep, but they're they've been caught by the wolf. They believe false doctrines. They're mixed up. They've been deceived by the wolf. And as a result of being caught by the wolf, now the sheep are scattered because you have some that believe this way and some that believe that way and they just can't... They... Are you aware of the fact that there are some home churches that have split three or four times? Are you aware of that? Well, why? Well, first the wolf catches the sheep, and then he, and then as a result of some of the sheep being caught, the sheep are scattered. It's happening all over the world. This, of course, is talking more of a spiritual scattering, a spiritual fracture, instead of a physical scattering. But when the spiritual unity is fractured, often the physical unity is fractured also. Yeah, but some people ask, them, why are there so many denominations? <laughs> the Catholic Church uses this as a major philosophical weapon against Protestantism. If you have any Catholic literature on this subject, they say, there's new Protestant denominations developing every day. They can't agree on how to take up the offering, so they start a new church. They can't agree on the color of the carpet, so they start a new church. There, there's so many different Protestant denominations, you can't even number them. Nobody even knows how many there are. That's what the Catholics say. And then they will follow that up by saying, well, now the Catholic Church, of course, that's just one. <laughs> by the way, it's a very powerful argument. It has brought millions of people into the Catholic Church. It's not crude. It's a very powerful philosophical argument. I've been waiting to see when the Seventh-day Adventist denomination starts to use that argument on the historic Adventists, because it could easily be used. Why are there so many denominations? Why are there so many splits? Because there's wolves in the fold. And the wolves have been catching the sheep and the result is that the sheep are scattered.
Oh no, I get too long when it again, I'm gonna stop. We can't have a second meeting, don't end the first one, so we're gonna end right away. But we'll finish up about the, I'll, I'll, I'll show you just a couple more statements, we'll finish up at the beginning of our next meeting on the world. I'll read you some really interesting statements in the Spirit of Prophecy about the world. But in closing, let me ask you this question. Or these questions. What would happen in our churches if everybody had gone through the door? And we covered that this morning. If everybody had gone through the door, what would happen is that you would have the Spirit of Christ in the church. You would have a spirit of harmony and unity in the church. This is the purpose of spiritual gifts, according to Ephesians 4, to bring harmony and unity in the church. If all Adventists would accept and follow the spirit of prophecy, we would have unity develop among us. We would only teach what is taught and explained in inspired writings explicitly. And if we did that, here's a few things that would stop happening. We would stop arguing over Bible versions. Now, I can't get into that. And by the way, it's fine with me if all of you use this version or that version. And I know there's bad versions. I can't get into that. I can't talk about everything. But the biggest problem is not which version people use. The biggest argument is, the biggest problem is the heated arguments people get into in this church splits that go over. And you come into some churches and they say, I've had people say, well, you can't preach here unless you preach from this and this. I say, oh, well, I'm sorry. And I can't preach there at all. And I have the version you're speaking about. I, I have I have a little stack of King James Version Bibles at my house. I even, in fact, I have a 1611 King James Version. Probably most of you don't even have one of those. I have one. Some of you couldn't even read it. But why are we fighting over these things? Why are we fighting over the feast days? Now, by the way, the issue actually isn't whether some person keeps the feast days or not. That is not the worst issue. The worst issue is that we are in absolute war over these things. Why are we in a war over the sacred names? If we decided to follow the spirit of prophecy, all these puppets and drama and skits and all that stuff would totally disappear from Adventism. We've been told not to have anything to do with drama. Because drama is breaking the ninth commandment. You're pretending to be something that you're not. But we won't listen. We would, if, if we would then follow the inspired writings, we wouldn't be reading fiction in Adventist schools. That would completely disappear. The ecumenical movement in Adventism that's going on right now would completely disappear. Worldly dress and, dis and adornment would disappear. We would become Bible Christians again. The drinking and drugs and fornication and adultery would disappear from the church. The lawsuits by Christians against other Christians would disappear. The commercialism and striving after money making would disappear. The violation of biblical laws of modesty and propriety would disappear from the ministry and the legal profession and the counseling profession and especially from the medical profession. We would start living according to the Bible. We would be keeping the law of Moses. Now, I'm not talking about ceremonial laws. Some people are unaware that the majority of the law of Moses is actually just an explanation of the Ten Commandments. God is going to have a people that have not been chewed up by wolves. According to the book of Revelation, 144,000 will be without fault before the throne of God. Are you going to be one of these people? I, I was at a meeting of ministers a few years ago. And there was some ministers there who said, they said, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist denomination is the remnant. I said, oh, really? I said, uh, so, I, so I asked these ministers, I said, I want to read to you something about the remnant from the Bible and I want you to tell me if you believe the Seventh-day Adventist structure meets this definition. 
so I read this verse. It says, The remnant of Israel shall do no unrighteousness and speak no lies, nor shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth, for they shall feed their flocks and lie down, and no one shall make them afraid. And I said to these ministers, I said, Are you going to tell me that the evidence structure is this? They said, No. It's not. Well, is God going to have a people that meet those specifications? Yes. It's Britain. That's the prophecy. Zephaniah 3.13. The question is, are you going to be one of them? My dear friends, the overriding long-term goal of my life is just to be one of those people. Whether I die or live doesn't even matter. That's the truth. Whether I die or live doesn't matter. All that matters is if I can be one of God's people in the last day, that's all that matters. In the long run, that's all that matters for any of us, isn't it? Are you going to be one of those people? God's going to have a people that have not been chewed on or caught by wolves in the fold. Well, we just got into the subject a little bit. I'll try to finish this as best I can about the wolves and then next time. I'm sorry I'm so long with it. But uh, let's pray before we take a break. Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus, our Savior, and the wonderful instruction you gave us. And we pray that your Holy Spirit will open up this instruction to our minds and our hearts that we might understand what the real message is. Help us to understand how serious life is and that the doctrines and teachings we accept, if they're coming from wolves, will trap us. And oh Lord, as we look around, we see Adventists all over the country that are trapped, and many of them don't even know they're in a trap. Lord, our hearts go out to them. We want to see them free in Christ. We want to see your people in unity and harmony. And Lord, we earnestly pray that your spirit will come upon us and that you will enlighten our minds and help us if we are if any of us here if we are in some trap of the devil and don't even realize that we're trapped we pray that you'll open our eyes and show us what to do so that we might become free in christ and thank you for hearing our prayer we come to you in jesus name amen thank you.